next up, we have Dominic Smith, who's Digital Projects Manager at uh, Timeside Cinema, going to talk about Timeside's engagement with uh, digital assets and digital material over the years and, and his current role, um, and give us some insight into how a resolutely venue-based institution, you know, we're in a darkened room with a, you know, sort of with, um, a good sound system, can, can engage uh, with uh, the, the pos potential, using my words, with the potential that digital has to offer. Dom. Okay, so um, I, apologies if I seem a bit nervous. I looked at the delegate list before I stood up. So um, I suddenly, you know, when you get that sense of impending doom that you're actually preaching to the choir, <laughs> I'm having that right now. So you'll have to just kind of uh, indulge me if, uh, as I go on. Um, so um, the title of this piece is uh, Pixel Palace, which is entirely Bill's fault. Uh, Bill thought of this name. Um, when I first started working here in September, I saw Bill and said, oh, thank you. I think you're responsible for my job, thank you. And now I'm looking at him thinking, yes, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the Pixel Palace is a, a really interesting uh, digital arts program here at the cinema. Um, and I've been working here since September. Um, and when I came for my job interview here, I kind of left thinking, oh my God, I've done a terrible thing because I sat down and said, I had to give an example project. What, what do you think would be good, uh, a good first project to do here? And I said, a radio station. <laughs> and I went home and held my head in my hands, thinking I went to an interview at a cinema <laughs> and said, should we, should we run a radio station? <laughs> but actually, uh, there were, uh, the, the, the team here were really on board with that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the reasons why I thought that would be a good idea. Um, so um, to kind of touch on something that Bill talked about. Actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about bootstrapping. Has anybody come across the term bootstrapping before? Yeah, so I think it originates with uh, Baron von Munchausen pulling himself out of the swamp by his own bootstraps. So it's a kind of metaphor for a self-sustaining process that requires uh, very little to start it. Uh, in terms of kind of just to uh, nerd out for a second, um, when you switch your computer on, it goes through the bootstrapping procedure, so a tiny little program will start a bigger program, then a bigger program, and as that increases, eventually you have the graphical interface that you use. Um, so the process here, and what I'm going to talk about in this case study, is how we're bootstrapping uh, broadcast capacity. Um, now something that happened while I started kind of thinking about making notes for this talk, and while I was making the notes, this thing called Turntable FM appeared in the world. Has anybody come across Turntable FM? And before I was finished writing it, it was already locked into North America because of copyright issues, so we can't go on it anymore. Uh, it was only, we could only go on it for a couple of weeks, but it, it looked like a lot of fun at the time. Uh, Turntable FM was just a, basically a chat room where people could share content. So by sharing content, they were DJing for each other. And that kind of desire to, to share your own material really drove it. Uh, and uh, I think this was it's kind of the first of many of these kind of experiences that are going to be made available. Um, yeah. So how are we doing this? So one of the things we've been doing, and the kind of the on button for the bootstrap process here, has been to take advantage of the cinema program so we have our directors coming and talking here quite a bit about the work. So I was able to kind of stream those talks for starters, just to kind of uh, get a, an idea of how the infrastructure would work in this building. The actual technology itself, believe it or not, is surprisingly easy and has been around for a long time. There are a variety of kind of servers you can use, from Shoutcast to Icecast to Flash to QuickTime. They're, they all kind of basically do the same thing, which is to serve up media to your computer. Um, and that works by you sending a single signal to the server, and the server multicasts that out to uh, as many listeners as you want. Um, one of the game changes recently has been the fact that people can listen to this stuff on their mobile devices. So it's taken this experience from kind of a lean-in experience where you're leaning heavily into the computer, hand on mouse, eyes glued to the screen, kind of re getting a bad back. <laughs> to um, being a take anywhere kind of experience where 
I've been doing tests on the kind of the small metro route in the northeast of England to see where the, where the uh, where we get dips in signal. So to see how long people can listen to streams on their way to the cinema. So there would be a potential to have shows and events happening in the, in the build up to people arriving here as well to kind of extend that experience. Uh, and I'm pleased to say the only dip is in Jesmond, of all places. <laughs> I don't know why that pleases me to say that. <laughs> um, so, t in terms of practicalities, I'm going to I'm going to talk money here, as to how small organisations could start this process. So, for a streaming server, you're looking at about two hundred pounds a year for kind of not a massive amount of listeners, but enough to get started and to build that capacity and to build that experience. Um, again, same podcasting is a great way of archiving live events. Um, you're going to need a few bits, basic bits of equipment which I've put in there. However, you probably already got them. Um, and then you're looking at licensing. And if you're looking at licensing, then you start to look at different types of capacity. So, if you uh, the kind of first stage in this bootstrap process would be to kind of get the small microcaster licenses, which, as you can see, aren't terribly expensive. So yeah, so I'm actually kind of from a kind of art and curatorial background. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what that means to this program and what that means to broadcasting. Um, well, it turns out artists are really good at finding new uses for technology, really, aren't they? Uh, I heard a talk a while ago by a chap called Miller Puckett, who was the developer of a program called Pure Data, which you can kind of use to make your own uh, kind of multimedia software, etc. And he said that uh, he was probably quoting somebody else, but he said, uh, "If you give an engineer a hammer, they'll read the instructions. If you give a, if you give an artist a hammer, he'll just start hitting things with it." Which is kind of one of the kind of first reasons that I'm kind of really interested in working with artists to find new and unexpected uses for this technology. Um, I would argue that art, the artists been at the kind of forefront of uses of new technology from the very kind of onset, from the, the early kind of dial-up home experiments. Uh, by John Giorno, um, through to a chap called, uh, I always struggle with this guy's name, J.H. Uh, Hogiviman, who is a New York based artist who I was lucky enough to interview a couple of years ago. And he had uh, been involved in a, a bulletin board system in the 80s called The Thing. A bulletin board is kind of pre internet, really early system for kind of exchanging messages. And he had produced this piece called Barbie and Ken, politically correct. Um, as you can kind of imagine, we released a picture uh, a week, which was kind of a, a one of those kind of jacky annual kind of things with uh, speech bubbles, etc. cetera, and uh, Barbie and Ken in compromising positions. Um, but the, the point that I'm gonna make here is that he had gone around various galleries in New York, cap in hand, kind of looking for an exhibition, and he went to a a gallery called YK Arts in uh, Manhattan, and um, he was kind of begging for an exhibition. And the tell the door went, and the guy was like, "Oh, just two minutes, I'll go and answer the door." And then he looked at his computer to find that his work was a screensaver on the curator's computer. So he had kind of bypassed that whole kind of gallery system where you have to kind of work your way through. To um, he was already in the gallery without knowing it. So this is kind of also. Uh, thing that I'm quite interested in as broadcast as an artist space, not just a means of marketing artwork, uh, but actually a space for artwork to exist in its own right. Um, and to get to that point, really, we have to look at the curated model. Um, now, I would kind of argue that a curator's job is uh, very much to do with interpretation of the work as well, and there is so much kind of going on out there that it's we really kind of getting to the point now where we need I'm going to break this right, so, yeah. um, we need to kind of look at how we present our information to other people um, and how we manage that content and one of the important factors in that is gatekeeping and uh, now I'm from a kind of hacking open source kind of background and the, the idea of gatekeeping may seem quite foreign to that but in actual fact that's one of the systems that the open source kind of models have a very strong uh, levels of gatekeeping to stop kind of somebody taking a, 
I don't know, a piece of graphical software and turning it into a music sequencer. As kind of, people tend to kind of have these kind of crazy ideas on the internet, you know? So it's really important that we kind of look at how we gatekeep that process. So revenue, I think there's probably a few people interested in revenue, and I'm not sure if I have great news about it being kind of a major source of revenue. But what I can tell you is that um, not only will it uh, bring bring new audiences, but it's also a way of uh, engaging with your existing audiences and finding out kind of what they want and uh, building a sense of community around your work. And one of the things we're developing that I'll talk about later is a way of kind of uh, having the artists who are involved in the broadcast communicating at the same time as those broadcasts are going out with the kind of with the audience at the same time to build that sense of community and to have that kind of conversation as the, as the work is going on. Um, and in doing that, I suspect that we will also kind of get more people coming into the building at that point as, a, as an organization. I've put micropayments in there because well, everybody puts micropayments in under the revenue head, don't they? Um, but there is a possibility of uh, uh, much of desired content uh, being funded via micropayments, not in a kind of pay-to-view way, but more in a kind of Kickstarter way, where people would fund uh, future content that they're interested in being developed. So the, uh, the future for uh, Pixel Palace, really, uh, where we're taking this at the minute, is we're going to be doing, well, we was just successfully received a GFA application from the Arts Council. Um, so what we're going to be doing with that is would be one of the things we'll be doing is to be releasing a series of monthly broadcasts and developing a series of monthly broadcasts um, as we kind of increase capacity. We're in the process of redeveloping the website. As you can see there, there's a kind of tiny bit of it, but the important factor is the launch radio button that we're developing. Um, so that'll be kind of one of the first thing that happens when you go on the website rather than just kind of what's on isn't this cool, look at these pictures, you're going to be straight into that kind of shared space. Um, and this kind of monthly uh, broadcast is building up to a collaboration with the AV Festival to produce a month-long, 24-hour-a-day broadcast uh, in collaboration with uh, Vicky Bennett, here, who goes under the name People Like Us, and we're talking to Kenneth Goldsmith as well at the moment. Um, so that's kind of um, where we're kind of heading in terms of capacity. Um, we're building capacity. We've still got kind of a ways to go. Um, but one of the things that kind of this kind of enthusiasm led to was an, a larger project that became kind of is kind of currently going under the title. Um, well, it was going under the title Populate but uh, a Latin title isn't necessarily the most accessible title for large groups of people. So it's now the Culture Network, and it's working across the, uh, the NGCV network in the northeast of England, which is um, NGCV is uh, Newcastle Gateside Cultural Venues. That would be a real faux pas to get that wrong at the moment. <laughs> um, and, that, and, and doing that, what we're developing is a, a collaborative structure to do larger kind of broadcasts and to prepare the way for um, internet protocol television, which has taken on a life of its own at the moment. So there is that kind of, there's the kind of small grassroots getting things done level, and then there's this much larger kind of system that's kind of coming out of that enthusiasm. So um, I'm not sure if I've gone over or under time. I'm kind of, I'm fine. Um, yeah, so really, um, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just remember the last bit. The, um, in 2012, after the month-long broadcast, we'll be kind of working more towards kind of video as well. We have done a series of video streams from the, from the cinema. Um, and what we found was um, the early stream process, you'd get like, it'd be quite, really quite disheartening just to kind of let you know if you do start doing this, you put a lot of effort into something and get five listeners which was kind of like devastating news at the time. Uh, and one of the important factors is to keep doing it, to keep going, because, uh, and to keep going regularly, 
because people expect it to be a place to go to at a certain time to find certain things. And if you don't provide those things, they don't come back. So you just have to keep going and going and going. So we started off getting five. The last time we did it, we streamed uh, Mike Hodges in the cinema. Uh, and we went over capacity. We couldn't kind of keep the thing kind of, we, the server kind of wouldn't let anybody else in to listen and watch. Especially when Alan Armstrong came on telling jokes about bees for some reason. It kind of maxed out. Uh, and the uh, chat room aspect of it was really useful as well to kind of to keep that conversation going and make people who weren't physically in the venue feel like they're still part of the conversation, they're still part of the event in itself. Um, and I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.